Welcome to the Open Door. Jim Hannock here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today we discuss ethical and legal questions at the beginning and end of life. We find an inspiration to do so in the visual arts. Richard Stith is our special and returning guest. He is a senior research professor of law at Valparaiso University. Professor Stith serves on the board of the Consistent Life Network, an organization that combats abortion, euthanasia, war, the death penalty, racism, and poverty. As always, we'll start with a prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. We're going to start in a different way today. We have a video, a short video, and some very provocative pictures of, of statues that uh, Richard's wife, Rose Marie, did for us. Could we begin with those? Very powerful, Richard. Yes, I thought we might um, spend a little time unpacking those two videos, uh, the two sculptures, one at a time, because I think they show different aspects uh, of the uh, ongoing decades old abortion debate uh, very clearly. Sebastian, could you show us the first picture of the tragedy sculpture? This picture shows the mother-child 
unity intact. And you see how they fit so perfectly together. The mother is represent and child are both abstract, but the mother is is quite finished. You see her her head is is all is quite smooth and, and refined. The child's head is was purposely left a little rough because he's still in the process or she is in the process of developing. So this is a picture of the mother-child unity. Now the interesting uh, concept that Rosemary had for this sculpture is it is a participatory sculpture. So the viewer is invited to abort the child. If you grasp the child's head and lift upwards, the child comes out and can be placed on the side. Please show the next. There you see the child removed from the mother, the child lying askew. This lying askew, of course, is a sign of death, a subtle sign, but a clear sign of death and remaining in the mother is a whole, is emptiness. So that is Rosemary's way of showing the essentials in very abstract form of the tragedy of abortion, which is one way to see abortion. Could we move on to the other way to see abortion? This is the triumphant view of abortion. It really has, is a common view nowadays because of the shout your abortion movement. That movement curiously has arisen only recently, but Rosemary in, in an act of great prescience made this sculpture in 1973. It was built on the pro-abortion movement in Connecticut where we were living at that time because there was a movement to overturn abortion laws and the symbol of that movement was a woman with her head back and her fist raised. And Rosemary's idea was to show her, uh, show her shouting, the, that was not in the, the typical logo, but show over whom she is triumphing. I'm sure that the feminist abortionist movement at that time viewed itself as triumphing over male oppressors. But Rosemary wanted to show uh, over what the, the movement is really triumphing or seeking to triumph, because this was pre Roe v. Wade. Uh, and then she, so she showed uh, the, uh, uh, the child there. Now, the interesting thing is that this act of triumph is meant to show a certain dehumanization of the mother. Drawing from Ernst Balach, a great German sculptor, the hair is disarrayed, the mouth is open, the eyes are closed, and the length of the legs is much greater than it normally would be because to show the sense of hubris, of pride, of arrogance, of triumph, lifting herself high over her child. And the child is not necessarily an aborted child. The child could be a child still in the womb, but the point is that the mother's will has triumphed over the existence of that child. Whether she lets it live or she lets it die, she is like the Roman emperor who could raise or lower his thumb to give a signal as to whether the gladiator, the defeated gladiator, should die. And Sebastian, could we move on to the next still photo? There you see a close-up of the child under the mother's feet. And Rosemary meant to show there that the child, unlike the mother, is not dehumanized. Of course, in reality, the child is torn to pieces but the child is at peace, meaning the child is spiritually at peace. 
The mother is spiritually torn. The child is spiritually at peace, resting there. So that was, those were the two images that, uh, that Rosemary uh, wanted to show, two ways of understanding a portion. And the idea in this video was simply to let the viewer uh, think about that, uh, not to preach. Uh, our thought was that Rosemary's thought was that uh, a very moralistic, a very sentimental uh, sculpture art is first of all, not viewed as very sophisticated uh, and won't do the pro-life movement any credit since we're in general viewed as uncouth uh, rednecks, not sophisticated. But, but secondly, uh, it's better for the viewer to, to come to conclusions on his or her own. Uh, and therefore that's, Rosemary just presented these two images and let, let the viewer, I, I've explained the meaning of the images in a way which uh, the ordinary viewer would have to do uh, on his or her own. But, but what do you, what do you guys think? This, this video has, has been, um, been around uh, uh, for about five years. And um, uh, do you think it would be, uh, more widely distributing? Yes, I do. I surely do. I think uh, the whole turn towards the visual is very important. Very, very important. And I, I think often overlooked. Uh, the arts are, are so very important. You and I, Richard, have a colleague in the uh, university faculty of her life who has looked at uh, across many cultures the treatment of abortion in literature and that too is I think neglected. Well I think uh, in general that um, the conservatives have focused very much on on political questions on legal uh, controls and have neglected uh, culture too much. Um, and uh, I think maybe that is beginning uh, to change uh, in the arts, visual and literary arts. I'd like to read a passage of, of yours that you wrote some time ago. And it has to do with not directly the visual, but I suppose you could say the conceptual visual. And uh, see what you have to say about this passage and perhaps we could uh, suggest uh, instances in, in which we see your distinction coming into play. Uh, some time ago you wrote, the polarization of our public debate over embryo destructive research may be due to a large extent, not to different evaluations of individual human life, but to different conceptions of the process of gestation. Now comes the distinction with one group treating the process as a making or construction and the other treating it as a development. There's an incompatibility there, isn't there, Richard? And, and how, how is the larger debate shaped by this uh, uh, different modeling of, of what's happening? Well, uh, Jim, the, the, um, the, the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that a making is, making is uh, discontinuous and development is continuous. Uh, let, let me give some examples. Uh, if a car is being made on, on an assembly line, uh, none of us would say that the car is there until whatever each of us thinks is the essence of a car is there. So um, we would all agree that a car is not there at the beginning when two pieces of metal are welded together. If that's the first step, I really don't even know what the first step is. But anyway, at the first step, no one would say a car is already there. No one would probably say a car is there when the, the, the next 20 steps either. You, we, we wait until the motor or the wheels or, or whatever we think is, is uh, 
the fundamentals uh, are there, and then we would say a car is there. So th that's what happens when something is being constructed. You know, a house too is not there until the roof at least is on, on top and so on. So uh, a, a car is discontinuous and, and it's, it, it's also subjective. Uh, you know, when is a car there? It depends on what each of us thinks the essence of a car is. Someone who just admires the, the chassis is going to say, well, it's, that's what's crucial. The car is there when the chassis is there. Somebody who thinks that they, they need to move and go places is going to say, think of wheels and motor and so on, this, this sort of thing. But, but uh, it's going to depend on individual subjective judgments and on the subjective feeling of how close um, uh, something has to be to being, for, to its essence, being complete to say that it's really there. If it's almost there or has to be fully there, that's, that's a something of individual preference. But we're all going to agree that, uh, first of all, that the matter is subjective and vague. And secondly, that the car is not there at the beginning. I think that's a perfect reflection of, of what pro-abortion people think about gestation. They think it's a process of construction. It's obviously not there at the beginning. And they just kind of, have disagree on what needs to be added before that it's essentially complete. But even if, if they agree that, gosh, the essentials are there and abortion after that point involves killing, they're going to say, you know, that's just my personal view of what the construction process, when the construction process is pretty much complete, you know, other people can have other views. That's how we would feel about if somebody disagreed about when a car is, is there finished on the assembly line, we wouldn't say, oh, you're dead wrong. You know, no, I'm, I'm right. I mean, it's just a matter of personal feelings, you know. So I think that's a the construction idea is uh, is the, is the underlying metaphysic, if you will, uh, behind uh, the honest belief of so many people uh, who favor abortion that abortion doesn't take a life. Now, if you um, look instead at the develop a developmental point of view, when something is developing. We think it's there from the beginning. And uh, the uh, example I, one can think of is a tomato plant. Uh, a tomato plant, uh, I choose the tomato plant because for a tomato plant, the essentials, the essential thing about to, a tomato plant, at least for human beings, is that it bears tomatoes. But we don't think a tomato plant comes into existence uh, only when it bears tomatoes. Uh, we may be unsure when the tomato plant first sprouts out of the ground, we may say, gosh, that doesn't look much like a tomato plant. But once it bears tomatoes, we know that it was always a tomato plant. And uh, uh, after it loses its tomatoes, after they fall to the ground, we know that as long as it survives, it still is a tomato plant. So development doesn't depend upon showing forth or manifesting the essentials because the essentials are there in the plant to begin with. It, they're not something added, not something constructed. Uh, another way to look at it is, is like reflecting what I just said. When something's being constructed, its essence, its idea, its, its what it makes, what it is, its quiditas, uh, is in the mind of the constructor, in the mind of the artist, in the mind of the blueprint. Or, or in the blueprint or whatever. It's not in the thing itself. But something that is developing has its own essence within it. It is simply, and etymologically in different languages, different words are used. It is unrolling, unfolding, unfurling, unveiling, develop, unveil. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, showing, showing what was already there. Um, uh, and uh, the... the uh, a nice example, which I've used and which has been while picked up by many people in the pro-life movement, is a Polaroid uh, snapshot idea. Suppose you and your spouse are um, uh, off on a trip down in Mexico, and your spouse, I want to make her a woman since we're all men, uh, your spouse uh, uh, takes a picture of a jaguar that has darted out of the jungle just for a moment. Now that's an incredible thing to get, uh, you know, because that doesn't happen very often. It's a uniquely wonderful picture. But I'm trying to think of 
is, is to a photographic comparison to the uniquely special character of every human being. So there's this wonderful uh, photo in the Polaroid camera that the, that the uh, spouse, the wife, has just taken. Now, you, if you remember how Polaroid cameras work, or at least used to work, I'm not actually, I think the new ones still work the same way. But anyway, the way they used to work was that you would, you would take that, uh, that film out of the camera and you had to wait a minute or so before to open it because it would, was developing. Now, suppose in this case that the husband is so excited to see that picture that he takes the film out of her camera and he rips it open right away. Or she's, she's horrified. She said, you, you destroyed my picture. Now, let's say hypothetically, he's trying to excuse himself. He says, but, but, but look, honey, look, look, look at this. It was just a brown smudge. You, you don't care about brown smudges, do you? Now, would, would that be a good argument? Obviously not. In the context of development, it's a ridiculous, it's, it's so absurd that she would be incredulous. How can you even make that argument? If it were, a pro, if it were a, 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 an, art, a, an art art piece uh, that was still in the brown smudge stage, it might, yes, it, it might have some importance. It would be a shame to destroy the art piece, but not nearly the importance of uh, of destroying an art a, a work of art in its completed form. But for a develop something under development, the completed form is already there. We're just waiting for it to come forth. So destroying it at any stage in the process is equally horrifying. Ariel, some thoughts on this, uh, this line of argument. Well, um, the uh, pictures, and I think the video is uh, very revealing. Um, and I would say is very, um, appropriate for our time, which is uh, pretty much inclined to perceptions and not much on argument, I think. And so when you see something that move your heart or generally does, rather than when you argue, sometimes you already have your own conclusion and you don't listen to the other argument. So that reminds me something that I think Hegel said, well, when reason cannot give you an account, then let the symphony begin. So I think aesthetics is uh, something that, um, at least in the Catholic tradition, we cherish uh, uh, from the beginning, and we may have been forgetting about that. So having said that, and listening to the question about these two views about, uh, I would call one more the development organicists or organisms which develop and are already there from the beginning and something is more mechanical and which we can trace back to, I don't know, to Descartes, but uh, these are two, seems to me that they are two worldviews which are very well developed out there. But my concern, my question is that these two views, these worldviews are completely incompatible. And not only that, when you hear people debating about the development of human life, just uh, you said, people may not listen to one another because they already are beginning from different starting points. So there is no dialogue ultimately because there is no common ground. And so, and then if that is the case, ultimately everything is reduced to power. And that goes for both sides. And if that goes to power, then pro-life trust in power too. And what count is whom we choose or select as a president because ultimately it's power. Now, <laughs> that is the conundrums that we are in. I think the issue is, or the question is, how to go about and make the other side things reasonably. 
uh, understand reality as a teleological. Um, otherwise, we are just in a battle, which is battle, which is political. Now, compared with the pictures, uh, the pictures are beautifully done, it's not political. It's something prior, so to speak, is beauty. Or the lack thereof is ugliness of portraying in a beautiful statue of the act that is portrayed there. So I don't know if I'm making sense what I'm saying, but my question is how then we need to bring really the reasonableness of this teleo teleological need so that another can see what we see? This is a very, very good question, Mario. And uh, let me first um, heighten the, 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 the difficulty, even beyond what you have said. It, it's not accidental that we are unable to communicate. It's inherent in these two views. From the constructionist point of view, the idea that life that each of us began at conception is absurd. It's as absurd as saying that the car is there when two pieces of metal are welded together. It's not just that we are mistaken, but we are just absolutely nuts. On the other hand, from a developmental point of view, the husband saying, look, why should you care about what I did to the Polaroid photo when there was just a brown smudge there and you don't care about brown smudges, they don't count, is just crazy from a developmental point of view. It makes no sense at all. And actually the, the article I've written about this, uh, some 40 odd pages in the uh, Kennedy uh, uh, Institute Journal of Ethics, uh, published back in 2014, um, uh, the, the fundamental question I'm talking about is, why are we so polarized? And the hypothesis I come up with on this issue is that we have different metaphysics or different fun, I don't use that word, different, different models of gestation. I, I avoid the word metaphysics or even theory. I just use the word model in order to remain postmodern and acceptable to everyone. But um, uh, so anyway, th that's the problem. Now, how to get um, around that? Uh, I think, first of all, the, the developmentalists um, have a number of things going for them. The, the const constructionism is really a theory which has a certain basis in human intuition. It has a certain basis, an uh, important basis in history. Uh, if you look back to Aristotle, for example, he thought that, uh, to cut to its, to its essence, that the child is being constructed in the womb by the father's sperm out of the mother's blood up to a certain point, at, at, up to the point where the rational soul is able to be infused, which is the last act of construction. And after that development begins. And there's the, but so, uh, and that was, a, that was the dominant view in the ancient world. It wasn't the only view. The contrary view was also from modern point of view absurd. But that is that the semen, which means seed in Latin, itself grew into a human being. The, just like other seeds do, uh, that, that became form or coagulated there uh, in the womb, in, in the fertile womb. So the image was of a seed being planted in the ground and growing. The, the father plants his seed in the mother's fertile. If the mother is fertile, the seed will grow. That was a developmental idea. So that was there. It wasn't the dominant idea, but it was also there. And those two ideas uh, really were uh, combated, were, were, were fighting with each other for thousands of years. And the, the was not really resolved until the, the 1820s. Uh, uh, in 1827, uh, an a, a absolutely uh, a breakthrough publication in German came out talking about uh, showing how uh, the human ovum exists and that fertilization occurs at the point where the sperm enters the ovum. And from that point on, develop, there's, a, there's development. But that I that the, the people didn't know about the ovum, and they didn't, didn't know about about fertilization until the 1830s, and that's when laws began to be tightened up, protecting. If you read Roe v. Wade, there's a nice history of that about 
how laws were were protected after uh, became more protective in early earlier pregnancy because this Aristotelian idea that early pregnancy is just a matter of fabrication had been overcome and this uh, the scientific idea of development had grown so so one of the things that uh, developmentalists have on their side is that that modern science is virtually or is unanimously on speaks agrees with them. Uh, the, the second thing they have on their side is that everybody is a developmentalist at some point. When a, when a baby is born, it can't reason, it can't speak, it can't love. It really can't do any of the things that we think make our species great. If there were, if there were some species in which the adult form were, were just like a human baby, Nobody would think that species is a fellow rational animal. You know, they, they, that's some kind of weird kind of monkey that doesn't develop. Uh, but anyway, uh, but it's because of the inner uh, developing essence that's there that, that we see the baby's little uh, first little smile as, as, the, as the, the, the waking of, of love and humor and, and, and reason. Uh, you know, the, so we, we are... Uh, certainly from birth, everybody, uh, or almost, there are people now who advocate infanticide in the early stages because they're instructionists even after birth. Uh, I think of Peter Singer and so on, but the vast majority of people are become developmentalists at birth. So uh, the, the, the strategy then would be to say that birth is just one point, a geographic point, a locational point in a process. Why should we shift? Now, in, in the ancient, for, for, for a thousand years, for thousands of years, uh, the idea of the infusion of a soul could be a reasonable hypothesis, and that could allow for a shift from constructionism in early pregnancy to developmentalism later. But nobody believes in that anymore. Nobody really believes that there's some soul inserted in the middle of pregnancy. So uh, with unless... Uh, 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 the uh, the constructionists, the advocates of abortion, are um, are able to come up with some sort of uh, uh, sharp dividing line. It looks like it's development all the way down. So I do think that there is uh, uh, we, we have science and we have the, the the commitment of people. And it's not just with human beings. I mean, nobody thinks that the tomato plant uh, comes into existence only when it bears tomatoes. They think. The tomato plant was there from the beginning. So it's our whole worldview is really developmental. It is not. And nobody thinks by all those, some people who favor euthanasia are trying to say, once you've lost your reason, you're no longer a human being. But actually nobody thinks once a tomato plant has lost its tomatoes, it's no longer a tomato plant. Uh, it's no longer a useful tomato plant, but it's still a tomato plant. So uh, really the, the people who want to hold fast to constructionism and say that the pro-lifers are absurd uh, are asking for a unique carve out of constructionism within a worldview, which is otherwise entirely developmentalist. Christopher, what do you think about this uh, juxtaposition? Well, I, I can see the two, the the distinction made between the constructionist and developmentalist. But I do think there's a third group, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the, it's the more predominant one, or it's going to be the more predominant one. And that's developmentalists, who people who recognize it, that the human being is developing in the world, but nevertheless um, promote abortion or, or want legal abortion. I'm thinking, it's, so it's not so much a, a difference in how they see human beings come to be but it's rather the very value of the human being itself. So for instance, let me, an example, this tomato plant, I, I grow tomatoes and I plant them from seed. And sometimes I get too many little seedlings within one, um, one, one planting. So what do I do? I pull up some of the seedlings. And why do I do that? Well, because if, you know, if they grow too close together, they're, not, one, they're gonna be weak. I'm not gonna have strong tomato plants. Now, I wouldn't go around and pull up a seedling just for the hell of it, right? Because I, the, the seedling is valuable. But when it's, when it's, when they're too, when they're planted too close together, 
something has to go, something has to give. I would suggest that that is often the idea that's behind a lot of abortion thought. And I, that it's not absurd, I think if we look back in history, something I brought up last time around, Richard, was that if, if you look at someone like Aristotle, who believed, at least at some point believed in the development of the human being, nevertheless would defend infanticide under certain circumstances. And I dare say every ancient civilization would probably had developmental ideas um, defended some form of defended some form of infanticide, not just not just abortion, but infanticide. So, are we? I see maybe what we're dealing with right now is actually devaluation of the nature of what we understand the human being to be itself. So it doesn't. Yeah, we all admit it's a human being, at, even from the earliest point of, con of conception. Nevertheless, we have a different idea of, of the value and the, uh, the nobility, the dignity of the human being. I think that is a, a very uh, important point, Christopher. The the, uh, the point of my Polaroid example, the tomato plant example, is only to show the identity and continuity of being. It isn't an attempt to show the value of being. Uh, and we don't value, we don't think tomato plants have unique, special, essential, infinite, or whatever you want to call it, value. So certainly uh, their identity doesn't do them much good and when it comes to uh, not being pulled up. Uh, we, we do, for a, in the modern world though, uh, have this curious consensus, unlike the ancient pagan world, we have this cons curious consensus about the unique value of every human being. That's why last uh, week I talked, uh, said it's so important for us all to get on board with the abolition of the death penalty because the, the left strongly is against the death penalty. In other words, but there's no reason to be against it. I mean, the people who, these criminals, the, the, uh, psychopathic criminals uh, are not only uh, interfering with the growth of other people, I mean, they're destroying the growth. I mean, they're like, like poisonous tomato plants. Why wouldn't you pull them up for goodness sakes to help your other tomato plants grow, you know? So, so th there really is a very strong notion of sanctity there, of inviolability of every human life per se that is that permeates the people who are otherwise against the sanctity of life. So we need to, we want to reinforce that, uh, that sense of sanctity that they have to say this is tremendous. And of course that's always a good first step in any conversation is to, is to find uh, uh, something to admire in your opponent and to compliment the opponent on that. Uh, before moving on to any disagreement. So that is something that, that we must uh, get on board with. We must compliment. We must credit them for doing it. And it's true. I mean, if, if the conservatives had been in charge of uh, history all this time, we would still have lots of executions. We have to thank the left for calling us our attention to the full scope of, of human dignity, of human inviolability. So we want to sincerely thank them for that. But also that strengthens that idea of inviolability. And then if we can combine the, the, the developmentalism, which we already know from science, with this uh, renewed commitment to the inviolability of every human being, then I think those two things together create a good argument against abortion. But one or the other is not enough. But we, we, Let me uh, suggest uh, a couple of distinctions. And in doing so, work our way back to Richard's two models and doing so as an unrepentant metaphysician. <laughs> One view in philosophy <clears throat> is to say that we can attribute a kind of being to value itself and I suppose we could call this value reification. I'm not inclined to that view, although I suspect that uh, von Hildebrand was inclined to such a view. And there is a resurgence of Hildebrandian thinking right now. My own view would be that to talk about values leads us to talk about the bearer of the value. 
And if we talk about the bearer of the value, then we're back in the context of our discussion to the constructionist versus developmental views. Uh, is it that which we're constructing that we're going to discuss in terms of its value? Or is it that which is developing that we're going to discuss in terms of its value? Now, there is a, a classical conundrum, and I, I know that Mario likes that word conundrum. There is a classical co conundrum uh, that goes under the uh, heading of the ship of Theseus, the ship of Theseus. So let's suppose you're this uh, well-heeled Greek individual named Theseus, and you think it's time to get your ship overhauled. And you have the ship brought into dock A, and adjacent to dock A, there's this dock B. Now, the workers uh, take one plank at a time from Theseus's ship, but they don't throw the plank away, they move it over to dock B. And bit by bit, they replace all the planks of uh, Theseus's ship, and uh, in doing so, reconstruct another ship in dock B. Now, Theseus comes by to, to look at the progress, and what does he say? And, in fact, he's not quite sure what to say, so he hires a lawyer to help him say what he wants to say. And what you could say is that, well, Theseus got ripped off. He brought in his ship to get overhauled, and there it is in Doc B. <laughs> there it is. It's all back where it was in Doc B, and he doesn't want to pay. On the other hand, there's this brand new ship in dock A and the people at the shipyard say, what do you mean you don't want to pay? Here's your ship, it's brand new ship. Now, the point is <clears throat> in classical philosophy that the principle of individuation, the principle of identity with regard to an artifact, and the ship is an artifact, that the principle of individuation and the principle of identity which is the, the foundation of Theseus' legal claim, uh, is external. It's external to the artifact. Come on, Theseus, pay up. What do you mean? I'm not going to pay up. Look, at, there's my ship. Well, that takes you back to your point, Richard, that it's a subjective identification. The principle of individuation, the principle of identity is external to the artifact. Whereas what you say, and I think rightly, we're talking about something that's alive, something that's not an artifact, and its principle of individuation and its principle of identity is not external to it. It is what it is, quite apart from what we might be inclined to say for various and competing pragmatic reasons. However, though, history is so messy when it comes to philosophy, it's your view, and again, I think it's a rightly held view, that we don't want to talk about, if we're talking about a developmental process, the uh, 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 um, bringing into the developmental process the rational soul. That would be arbitrary. It's either there from the beginning if we're talking about the developmental view of things or it's not there from the beginning. But in fact, <clears throat> there are any number of people that get so messy who uh, believe in what's called delayed hominization. And a very close friend of mine, who were he watching right now, he'd probably be poking me in the ribs, wants to say that despite Everything that you've pointed out about the development of embryology, especially since the 1830s, he wants to say still the matter isn't so disposed yet until a certain point that would allow for the uh, uh, infusion of the human soul. So some of these arguments are just really hard to displace. However, and I, I would like to make this last point, Insofar as we more and more mechanize the human person, insofar as we more and more talk about the possibilities of transhumanism, 
insofar as we more and more delight in the, uh, the bionic, uh, then not only do we have a mechanistic process, but we have a, a, a replaceability, a fungibility. We can move the parts around as we want. And we can't do that, at least not nearly so readily in a developmental model as we do in a mechanistic model. And insofar as we have this movement of parts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and the lure of transhumanism, the plot once again thickens and the ethics once again sickens. Uh, and so the, the work I think of the metaphysician continues. We're, 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 we're always uh, able to find employment even if no one will pay us uh, uh, for what it's worth, for what it's worth. Well, let, let me just comment on a couple of things you've, uh, you've, you've uh, dug us deeply into here. Uh, I don't, wouldn't have time to address everything. But uh, I, I think you have pointed out that um, it is really the, um, the Aristotelian or the theist who is able to construct a pro-abortion point of view, not the modern person, the modern scientist. Because you have to begin with this idea that there is some sort of soul infused into the developing being in order to have delayed insolment, delayed anima, anima meaning soul, and delayed animation means delayed insolment. So if you've got that theological or, or Aristotelian point of view at the beginning, then you could worry that maybe there's, it's not until the first week or the second week or five weeks or whatever, you could try to find some signpost where you think the soul is getting infused. I don't know how you would do that. But, but that's all alien to modern biology. Modern biology says, no, the zygote is developing itself from conception. There isn't any infusion and you don't, you don't need an infusion. So you, you need an infusion with, with, with the constructionist model. You need, because you, you, we know we have developmentalism. Everybody knows after birth you have developmentalism. So you have, or, or at some point a few weeks after birth if you wanna have infanticide. But it, it, for, for us full members of the human community, uh, we think of ourselves as as developing. Um, so so we have to have at some point a shift from construction to development. You, you needed an infusion, uh, either a God inserting a soul or, or something else. Aristotle isn't very clear where the soul comes from. But anyway, uh, the the uh, but you don't need that with my, the, the problem isn't there. So the metaphysical issue is gone. I mean, people are debating a problem that existed for bi for biological knowledge before the 19th century. After the 19th century, the problem is gone. So that, that's basically you know, the, the short answer. Now the other, the, other the, 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 the ship question, when is the ship there? This is, deals with the problem of essence versus existence. You know, the thing is for human individuals, what we value about them is, because, is their essence, that they are our fellow human beings. But that essence, somehow makes us care about their existence as individuals. Now, I maintained last time, I don't want to go over that all again last time, that no matter how highly you value an essence, you think human beings are just fabulous. They're, 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 they're like angels or better than the angels because of the incarnation. So they're, they're just, wow, it's just incredibly how great you are. That doesn't mean they aren't fungible. They aren't, you couldn't eliminate some and replace others without a defect better reasoning ones or transhumanism, uh, you would still be valuing human beings, you know, but better human beings, you know. So, so uh, but, but it, it, to, to make the existence count, you need an attitude which, which doesn't just say, we want this set, but says that this set of beings is inviolable. And there's where I use the word respect. Respect is a stand back idea. And the, uh, if we stand back from all the members of a set, then every individual existence of a being in that set counts and matters. If we think the set as a whole is what matters, the individual components don't matter. So that's why I strongly emphasized shift from respect to value. But going back to our earlier point, I know we're getting near the end of the hour, 
the, the point there's is, always another hour there's always another hour no, but, but but this is closely connected to what christopher said uh the the problem is of of how to dialogue how to reach people it's not enough to have modern science it's not enough to have the our developmental view uh, that we have for tomato plants and for everything else in the world on our side, there still is an intuitive problem, an imaginative problem. When people look at a at the first sprout out of the ground, out of the ground, and somebody says that's a tomato plant, I, somebody can easily say, "Well, it sure doesn't look like a tomato plant to me. It's a piece of grass, you know, uh, sprout a blade of grass." And and so uh, the, the same thing can happen uh, for embryos. When people look at embryos and they they um, uh, 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 don't see a fellow human being, they, they see a spot, you know, a, a dot. And uh, how does that get overcome? Well, in the case of the tomato plant, once the, the plant bears tomatoes, we know it was always a tomato plant, but that doesn't help us see the tomato plant in the sprout. It doesn't help us see the human being in the embryo. Our imagination is, in other words, is not capable very easily of transformation, understanding metamorphosis. Morphos, Greek word for form, transformation has the Greek, the Latin word for form, forma in the word transformation. If a transformation, a metamorphosis still has to occur between the embryo and the, and the baby, it's hard for our imagination to grasp that. And that is why we need to use, in, as part of the uh, abortion debate, we need to use the same thing that works with tomato plants. We need to say, look, this young woman was conceived in rape. Do you think she should have been aborted when she was just an embryo? Do you, this young man has Down's syndrome. Do you think he should have been aborted when he was just an embryo? Uh, do all of us, in fact, don't don't we all agree that all of us are grown up embryos? We, we all began as an embryo because looking back, just like with the tomato plant, we can say, of course, we were there from the beginning. But you, it's we can't intuit that if you just show pictures of embryos and zygotes and and so on. Fetuses, it gets easier because they begin to look more like babies. So. Um, I think we need to use, uh, our imagination works backwards much better than it works forwards. So we have to be, we have to use, and the bishops have done that, for example. They had uh, some posters some years ago where they had a picture of a little baby saying, jo just 270 days ago, Joshua was an embryo. Uh, should he have been destroyed? You know. So this is, uh, is a, where the rubber hits the road to, to actual uh, images and 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 ads and uh, you know and, and arguments. We want to show the we want to show developed embryos and then ask people shouldn't they be have been protected even at their beginning. Mario Richard is right. We are coming close to to the end. What thoughts would you leave us with? What questions would you raise? Well, the. The, uh, one of the uh, topics that uh, Richard mentioned, I think is um, crucial, is that he said that something of the consensus about defending um, human dignity, which rep show in the agreement that we may have uh, about uh, the death penalty. I agree with that, but there is one... <laughs> One issue that puzzled me, yes, we respect and we defend um, death penalty. And that was mainly thanks to humanitarianism in the 19th century, 17th century, and so on. But the claim was that we became to defend that not because something intrinsically uh, worthy of respect rather than the uh, the weakening of faith in the transcendent world. So we are defending the life here because there is uh, nothing at the, at the end of the, 
of, the, of our life. Having said that, the same people who are defending um, or um, favoring, um, defending um, the death penalty, the, against the death penalty, I'm sorry, um, are the one who do not see the worthiness in um, prenatal life. And so the question is, is that lack of respect due to philosophical misunderstanding, uh, biological misunderstanding, or there is something else, which is the weakening of uh, faith, Christian faith. And so, because people may say, yes, the embryo is there, but I don't see a human person. I see a human being. And then all this uh, very strange distinction between what a human being is, which has free, uh, uh, free will and understanding, but an embryo is not with those uh, properties yet. So why is that those people who agree on the death penalty may not have this awareness of the dignity of a, an embryo? And that, to me, is um, the key issue. And you see that all the time when a, a, a abortion law is approved, you have hundreds of thousands of people cheering about that. And the same people probably will be against the death penalty. What is that and is happening here? Is the because the Christian faith is no longer uh, making us aware of human dignity, uh, weakening our reason about this uh, view of reality. To me, that I think is an, an open question. Well, I, I think uh, Mario that that uh, the weakening of faith is is a problem in terms of recognizing the hu human dignity. It was taken as a matter of of faith uh, by so many uh, in the past. But I think the weakening of faith is also a way of, uh, is a partly the reason why human dignity has been revealed. The way I would put it this way, in a, in a society based on faith, a theocracy, the fundamental principle holding the society together was obey God's will. And so you really didn't need to worry too much about what was intrinsically valuable, not intrinsically valuable, worthy of respect. Just do what God tells you, you know. God says, uh, whoever sheds man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed? Well, do it. I mean, that's what God tells us. So that doesn't destroy the society because the society is held together by faithfulness to God. But once the belief in God is gone, we the only thing that holds us together is, our, is, is ourselves. And we need to be acting for the sake of each other. So suddenly the, the notion of human dignity becomes a foundation because we don't have that divine support. And now to, to attack and destroy our fellow human beings through the death penalty, for example, or other, any other kind of killing, not only it, it seems to, to uh, be unappealing, but it destroys the, the fundamental, meta, fundamental metaphysical basis of the society. Once, the, once we can kill to a, other human beings to gain what we want, rather than helping them, uh, there's no limit. There's no goal. There's no other purpose. What, a, what, what other purpose is it's going to be to, to, to control the world or the, the grandeur of the nation or something like that? Some horrible thing. So uh, the, uh, but anyway, it was the absence, the, the loss of faith, I think, awakened people. I, I don't think, it, I think that was really a positive thing. It awakened people to the idea that, gee, how can we kill someone else? Uh, it used to be, well, God told us to do it. Not my fault. God told me to do it. But now that we can't say God told me to do it, we've got to say, can I really do it? No, I can't. So I think that is a, a strength of secularization, something that it's taught us and, and that we can we need to make use of to, to what we've lost the divine command not to kill uh, babies before or after birth. But we've, we've, we've got this sense of human dignity uh, that uh, that the loss of faith has given us, and that's what I think we can build on. Thank you.
We had originally planned to discuss today uh, euthanasia, and we could have introduced a, a number of the categories that we did discuss today. We could introduce those in a discussion of euthanasia. And we're largely out of time, but we have this weekly podcast, and we're going to have you come back, and our focus will truly be on those issues. Only because of uh, our next discussion with you being on those issues, I want to mention that just yesterday or the day before, uh, the Pontifical Academy uh, of Life on Life issued a, a very strong statement calling to our attention, and this is so closely related to euthanasia and so-called assisted suicide, that we, we more and more banish the aged and the very elderly. We more and more banish them to depersonalizing institutions. And the more they are banished from our, our myths, from our everyday life, the more expendable they become. And we've seen that so clearly with COVID. Uh, there's a kind of a massacre of the elderly coming about, uh, which may be surprising some people, but it, it, it ought not to be so very surprising at all. Uh, the unborn, we don't see. The very elderly and the sick, we put aside. So we don't see them either. We congratulate ourselves if we go for a visit every couple of weeks. Well, all of that will be for next time. This time, we close with today's gospel from Mark. Jesus summoned the crowd again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, nothing that enters of one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile. When he got home, away from the crowd, his disciples questioned him about the parable. He said to them, Are even you likewise without understanding? Do you not realize that everything that goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and passes out into the latrine? Thus he declared all foods clean. But what comes out of man, that is what defiles him. From within the man, from his heart, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's Maybe very not. good. Next next week we're we're scheduled, but uh, I'm going to see if the week after next week we can uh, return for part three. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.